Hello, welcome back to the shed. So, <clears throat> friction. Um, I was reading a, uh, a tweet. I was reading a tweet the other day and it asked, does anybody use the GP FAX race pads on the road on their bike? Or does anybody use race pads on the road on their bike? And how would they be in terms of braking? Because um, this guy had a friend who uses them on his VFR 750 and he said, he feels he can break a little bit better and I think the tweet was a little bit tongue-in-cheek really um, but he was basically posing the question who else uses race pads on the road and I've never looked at my bike I've never looked at the pads on my bike I haven't had it long enough really to even consider taking them off at the minute without all the other little projects I've got going on so I'm gonna have a look at mine <laughs> Okay, so mine are basically described as a moderately aggressive, everyday um, and possibly sort of sport street riding. It says they've got ceramic backing plates on them to assist with temperature management, uh, to dissipate the heat better. Um, it says they're made from an advanced uh, ceramic composite, which is able to withstand higher temperatures than regular semi-metallic um, carbon brake pads. Um, it says they're friction rated compounds, they deliver excellent feel, uh, modulation and stuff like that. It says they're capable of handling almost any type of riding that you throw at them. So they're not race pads and I'll put a picture up to show what they are. Um, they're just standard pads, it says there's no brake fade, it says they're performance for performance riding, um, amateur racing. Um, but it says they're not race pads. So the manufacturers basically boast uh, the mu, what we call the mu number. And all of the, ad all of the manufacturers tend to advertise that now. Um, but mu, or the coefficient of friction, or friction is really a science within itself. So we need to have a look into, into what friction actually is and what it actually means for our, uh, our brake pads. Because it can be a, you know, for race professionals... Um, it's, it's pretty important. So it might be whether it's rolling friction or mechanical friction or air friction, you know, the list goes on, but we're talking about brake pads. We're talking about them, you know, they advertise this number, this friction number, and to answer the question basically fairly and sci scientifically, we need to look at more than, we need to look more than just the number that they give you, um, that they always seem to quote. Because um, after all, you know, what does that number even mean? What does that, that advertised friction number mean? Um, such numbers are quoted by manufacturers basically as if they're the defining factor in brake pad selection. Um, like the only thing that's important, you know, rubber onto dry concrete, for example, has a coefficient of friction greater than one. It's about 1.16, but you wouldn't want your pads on your fire blade made from rubber. It's got an extremely high friction rating. But, you know, so obviously the compound, the composite of materials that makes up the pad is also of great importance. And also the backing plates as well, um, you know, on the pad itself. You know, ceramic, for example, helps to, 
uh, dissipate heat a lot more quicker and a lot more efficiently than steel. So let's have a quick look at what friction is all about. Okay, so basically friction is the resistance force that's generated between two bodies. So basically as they move across each other, okay? So for example, if that's the contact area, the, the friction is the resistance generated between the two bodies as they move, as they oppose each other basically, and it's proportional to the force that presses the two bodies together. And this diagram shows, or will show, um, the forces acting on a block that's sitting on, a, sitting on a surface, basically. But this applies to everything, of course. So we've got a block, we've got a mass, and we've got a surface. Okay, so the block is pulled down onto the surface by the force of gravity, okay? So we've got a downwards force there, okay? And we'll call that mg. And mg is basically mass times gravity. Of course, you've got to believe in gravity for this. Lee Madden, he knows what I'm on about. Um, so mass times gravity. So the block is pulled down onto the surface by the force of gravity while the surface basically pushes back. So the block's pulled down, but there's an equal and opposite force, obviously, of the surface pushing back in an equal and opposite force, and that's known as the normal force. So we've got an equal and opposite force acting from the surface upwards, and that is called the normal force. As you know, equal and opposing force. If a horizontal force is applied, such as pushing the block to the right hand side, then the block will obviously begin to accelerate. So if we add in a force there, F, so one, two, just to make them a little bit easier to see. So experience tells us if we apply a force to the right hand side of this block, um, I said it would start to accelerate, but you know, experience tells us that this doesn't always happen. If you try and push something heavy, it doesn't always move until you've pushed hard enough. And that's the key. You've got to push hard enough. And that's the key with friction and the coefficient of friction. There must be a force working in the opposite direction um, of us pushing the block that's resisting the motion. So we're pushing this way, it's not moving until it gets to the point where we push hard enough. Therefore, there must be a force opposing. And that force is the force of friction. So the opposing force that's stopping that block moving, before we get to the point where it actually moves, that's friction. And experiments have shown the magnitude of this force is dependent upon the normal force. Um, that's the opposing force. Um, so the, basically the proportionality constant between them is called the coefficient of friction. Um, and the coefficient of friction is, looks like this. This is how we write it. It looks like a little u and it's pronounced mu. Mu. And that's, that's the Greek. So the coefficient of friction, which is this opposing force, the coefficient of friction uh, depends on two factors. The first depends on the material, um, basically the materials that these two objects are made of. Um, so obviously the surface will be a material on our motorcycle, it's our rotor, and the block is a material. On a motorcycle, it's the pad. Um, okay, that's that's the first factor. It's basically it's easier to move. For example, it's easier to move fifty kilograms of ice on a glass surface 
than it is 50, kilo, 50 kilograms of stone on sand, for example. You know that from experience. But the glass, the ice, the um, stone, the sand, they've all got their own coefficient of friction. So the coefficient of friction is the number given to that material. Um, the second factor is whether or not the block is moving. Is the block static or not? Um, you may have noticed it's usually easier to move, and you, you've definitely noticed it's easier to move a heavy object once it's already moving. So that must mean then that there's two different coefficients of friction. You've got a coefficient of friction for when the block is stationary in one position, when a force is being applied and the resist a resisting force is in place. And that's your static co coefficient of friction. So that one is the static. And then you've got the coefficient of friction for when the block begins to move, which is your coefficient of friction kinetic. So that's just explaining that there's two different types of coefficient of friction. There's one, once the block is moving, there's obviously a resisting force still, but it is moving. And then there's a resistance force against the stationary block. And that's what we mean when we talk about friction. So in theory, and if we're purely discussing the pad on the rotor, um, the more aggressive the pad, the greater you know its stopping potential. In theory, the more aggressive the pad, the greater stopping potential you've got. You know, basically the same lever force should provide more stopping power in theory. But that isn't taken into account temperature. Um, you know. The coefficient of friction ranges from zero, which is basically full lubricity, or to basically one, which is solid, sort of no molecules moving at all. Um, 30 years ago, street brake pads were lucky to see the high 0.2s in the coefficient of friction. Today, even OEM pads, you know, even the cheap pads are well into the 0.3 top tier performance street pads are in the... 0 0.4, 0 0.45 range, and race pads then tend to move up into the 0 0.6, 0 0.7, even 0 0.8 range. So the coefficient of friction is important, but it's not the only thing. And we also need to remember that a pad's um, friction rating is not constant. You know, um, it varies due to changes in temperature, changes in humidity, wear, age, loads of factors. So, you know, um, the engineers that manufacture these pads, they, they strive to develop more stable pad compounds um, that maintain their consistency over lots of different operating conditions and lots of different environments. The problem is, as that happens, these compounds become more exotic and they also become more expensive. Um, the more aggressive pads, um, the ones with the higher mu, the higher coefficient of friction, um, those compounds can increase your rotor wear unless you've upgraded your rotors and you've come and got some stainless steel, you know, hardened rotors. I've got Armstrong stainless steel induction hardened um, wavy discs. They're about 100 quid each. Um, you know, induction hardened discs is basically, um, it, induction hardening is basically a form of heat treatment where um, the metal part is heated by um, induction heating and then it's actually quenched. And then um, the quenched metal basically goes under um, a Martin Sissic transformation, which is the crystalline structure, and that increases the hardness of the disc. So, you know, obviously the pad squeezing the rotor creates a frictional force on the rotor and then that obviously in turn slows down the bike. But it isn't just about the pads, as I've said. You know, the torque generated on the rotor isn't just dependent on pads. It's dependent, it's a, it's dependent upon three different variables. You know, how hard the calipers squeeze the pads against the rotors. You know, what determines that? You know, what calipers have you got? Um, <laughs> how is your brake fluid looking? Have you got performance brake fluid? Have you got air in your brake, brake fluid? What are your brake lines like? You know, are they braided? What's your master cylinder like? You know, 
what's the diameter of the of the rotors and their swept area of braking. You know, as a simple rule, the larger the diameter of the rotor, the more force that is available to stop um, to stop the wheel. So. Um, just like, for example, using a longer wrench makes it easier to break um, a bolt loose, so, unless you shear it, of course, but, you know, it's the same. If you kept the same caliper and the same pads, but installed larger um, diameter rotor, you would basically get greater stop in power, providing your rotors are up to speed with your pads. Um, so, you know, the coefficient of friction between the pads um, and the rotor itself, it, it, it isn't just all about the coefficient of friction, it isn't just all about I'll get those pads because they're 0 0.6, 0 0.7 rated pads. Um, you know, I mean, everything else being equal, a higher coefficient of friction, yeah, it yields more braking force, but all of that braking force generates a lot of heat. Um, so there's so much to think about, not just the pads. You know, heat isn't a problem as long as the rotors and the pads don't get so hot that they exceed their design temperature range. If that happens, you end up, you know, with all sorts of problems. You know, when, for example, when brake pads are used outside of their designed temperature range, their coefficient of friction, that friction number, it diminishes. And that's where you get your brake fade. Um, you know, if the pads get too hot, um, they can also lose uh, structural um, integrity. It, it's, it's possible. So like the materials that bind um, the friction materials together um, can actually break down. And then the pad, you know, the pad could even begin to disintegrate. Um, so, you know, it's not just a yes or no. You know, brake pads have a maximum temperature range. Um, once the pad reaches that temperature, um, it can start to lose its effectiveness. They also have an optimum, um, optimum operating temperature for low and high temperatures. So, you know, between the low and the high temperature is when those pads work best. Uh, having, um, having a high temperature pad, for example, on the street, the race pads, it'll make stop in power decrease because the pads will rarely, if ever, get up to optimum operating temperatures. And that is what you've got to be careful of. That is what the friction coefficient is all about. You know, and vice versa as well. If you go racing on stock or street pads, the temperature of those pads rise immediately and, you know, you'll lose your braking performance. So it isn't as simple as just saying, I'm going to get them race pads and I'm going to put them on my bike, on my street bike or on my road bike. Brembo, for example, they say about their Z04 compound pads that the most significant um, characteristics of, of their material um, are its high, high friction and um, consistent performance. But, you know, for those applications low temperature efficiency is less important and as a result that those those pads those race pads they're not suitable for road use um ebc boast about a friction value of 0 0.6 and 0 0.7 brembo quote a cold value of about 0.76 and a warm hot value of about 0 0.79 0 0.81 that's huge that's really huge that's such a massive friction con you know but we're not here to argue about who has the higher coefficient of friction. It's really just to discuss the question at hand, which was all about, you know, will these pads stop me quicker on the road? You know, are they going to work? Um, but a frictional coefficient does not always equate to stopping power. The higher, you know, it's not necessarily how hard you have to squeeze the lever for a given um, retardation, which is obviously, you know, you're stopping uh, retardation is stopping force. Neither is it like um, ne neither is it the higher the coefficient of friction figure, the less you need to squeeze a lever. It doesn't always work like that. You know, a Brembo pad with a rating of about zero point eight on the friction will not necessarily stop you any faster than a pad with a zero point seven um, coefficient rating. You know, 
you would need identical bike setups with the two different pads with two identical braking lines and braking times and braking pressures you know to even know what is going to happen there manufacturers state that the coefficient of they state the coefficient of, of, of friction values because it's relevant you know same bike same brakes brembo just picking the first manufacturer that i've found figures for should effectively stop you quicker than ebc because it's slightly hard you know but again the higher the coefficient of friction um effectively the less fluid pressure so it should effectively mean a, a lighter pull of the lever um is what that would be required to produce a higher braking force once warm once warm once at the required temperature um so i mean you know what about the friction between the rubber and the road what about lock up due to surface adhesion you know of your of your rubber on the road you know that depends on the chemical nature of the road the asphalt the concrete its texture um, the rubber compound in your tyre, rubber and road surface temperatures, um, the sliding speed of, of rubber relative to the road. So, you know, most racetrack surfaces differ from each other, and that's what makes racing brilliant. You know, it's not all a perfect science. Some track segments are significantly dif uh, different in um, texture um, and, and possibly chemical composition from others. So it all varies. I mean, the other thing to think about as well with pads is the mixing of old pads with new rotors. You know, um, new pads with new rotors um, or new pads with old rotors. You know, what if, um, what, if the, what if the old pads have grooves in them from the previous rotors? Also, I'd never mix brake pad manufacturers um, on the same rotor because some um, manufacturers pad materials the composite the compound they're not compatible with each other and it depends what you're using so for me swapping your brake pads for racing pads um, on the road for me it's really not a great idea and I know there's people out there that do it and that's absolutely fine but you know these compounds um, they're a science, they really are, and they're designed to operate um, at uh, higher temperatures for a sustained period of time. And the word sustained is the key, you know. And also, if you do happen to crash with race pads on and survive, and hopefully you do and you will, it's likely that your insurance, and this is important, you may want to look this up, but it's likely that your insurance could be invalidated because a lot of race pads don't carry the ECE R90 or Regulation 90 legislation. Um, and basically that legislation includes the cold and the hot brake friction analysis. Um, and then the brake pads are then marked with the R90 code um, and a country code. For, for example, um, E11 is for the UK. So it's really worth checking that out too, because you know if it invalidates your insurance, you could be in a world of trouble, especially with an expensive bike. The friction coefficient of modern brake pads should be low enough to prevent locking of the wheels, but it should be high enough to provide sufficient stopping power. Friction coefficients are typically between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5 for brake pad materials. So there's a lot to think about but it was worth an investigation. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.